According to a new survey by Jackman and the Center for Working Class Politics, in 2020, 63% of voters did not have college degrees and 74% came from households making less than $100,000 annually. And while the working class stands to benefit the most from progressive policy ideas, the left has been losing workers vote, voters for ye, working class voters for years. And as our next guest, Matt Karp, points out, no social democratic project can succeed without a working class base. So the team over at Jacobin, YouGov, and the Center for Working Class Politics surveyed 2,000 working class Americans to obtain a new and more accurate perspective on the working class's political views. Here now to discuss the biggest takeaways from that survey is associate professor of history at Princeton and Jacobin writer Matt Karp. Matt, welcome. Hey, happy to be here. Yeah, so one really important thing is when non-corporate entities start getting into the polling game. It's something that we've been doing at the, the Federalist as well, because the way that corporate news outlets frame questions in their polls can be really misleading sometimes. And one thing I really loved about this survey is that it put the question to actual working class, questions to working class people in the right framework and with the right sort of terms. What, did, what were your biggest takeaways from the responses you guys got? I mean, yeah. I mean, just to begin with the, the the framing of the survey itself. I mean, as as Ryan as Ryan pointed out, this is a demographic that Democrats have been losing um, for years. Chuck Schumer, infamously. I mean, we all remember that you know that moment in 20, 2016 when he really let the cat out of the bag and said, you know, this is not just an artifact of of history. This is our explicit strategy for every blue collar voter we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we're going to pick up two, uh, you know, Republicans in in the Philadelphia suburbs. Democrats have been pushing this for a long time under uh, under different guises. Um, and our view at, at Jacobin and at the Center for Working Class Politics is that this, um, you know, not only do working class voters represent the su a super majority of the electorate uh, and are a necessary component of any coalition that can achieve a uh, big majority um, in Congress or, or drive forward a progressive agenda, they're absolutely essential to uh, a left wing agenda, to anything that, you know, could attain something like Medicare for all or a, a, a larger scale um, uh, progressive transformation in the country. And I guess to, to pivot to the takeaways, I mean, the most important umbrella finding was that the universe of potentially democratic working class voters, that is 70% of the working class electorate, 70% of voters without college degrees, is broadly uh, on board with progressive politics. That is Medicare for all, that is a politics oriented around a federal job guarantee even, um, politics that uh, name a uh, ultra, ultra rich, millionaire elite as the enemy of of um, of economic gains for the working class um, in in both in substance and in language um, these voters are available to Democrats but the way that politicians make their pitches really matters and we found real gaps in between uh, different styles of making uh, pitches for progressive politics right and so there's you, you talk in the in your, in your survey write up about how there's this this myth this idea out there that there's this, this great kind of left-wing mass of people who are so cynical about politics that if they believed that a politician was really going to deliver for them, that this, this, this mass would rise and, and would you know, deliver uh, you know, a, a progressive working majority you know, for whoever could make that claim. And, and while you did find that, like you said, 70 percent or so, you know, identify with broadly progressive I, I, economic ideas, that it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that. And that if every single working class voter you know, was forced to go to the polls and cast a vote, it wouldn't actually necessarily benefit Democrats. So, you know, why is that and what do you know, what what needs to happen so that you trigger that that 70, 70 percent of economic agreement? that the working class has with, with Democrats rather than the hostility that they have around so many other issues. Yeah, no, that's well put. And I think, I mean, there is some sobering news in this in this survey too. Uh, there, there's some good news that I'm gonna get to for, you know, at least for people who are interested in um, connecting working class politics to egalitarian policy. Um, but there's some sobering news in this, in the sense that the kind of most idealistic version of the, 
Uh, I'll say this as, you know, no one was a more diehard Bernie Sanders supporter than me, but the most <laughs> idealistic version of the of the Sanders theory of politics, the kind of if you speak it, they will come idea. Um, you know, we saw how that worked out at the polls in terms of generating new voters and new turnout. It was not as successful as, as, as you know, I'll say we royally had hoped. Um, and I think this survey, in a sense, confirmed some of that by, um, you know, showing that by and large working class non-voters are not ideologically any more progressive or left-leaning than working class voters. And in a sense, uh, uh, in this universe of the sort of 70% potentially democratic uh, working class vote, we left out the sort of hardcore, strong Republican partisans. Um, but within this within this gettable universe, um, you know, politicians, including left-leaning politicians, maybe especially, have to work hard and be smart um, and uh, in effect match their own electoral pitches to what these voters want. They can't simply sort of speak a, a timeless truth of egalitarian policy and expect that these disillusioned voters are going to flock like, um, you know, flies to this honey. They have to actually, you know, do politics. And so we found, um, to get to some of the, the big findings, I mean, we found that there are real gaps between different styles of political messaging, um, different uh, focuses of politics. I mean, I guess I would I would put th I, I would sort of divide that into sort of three main axes that each you know accounted for broadly speaking a five a five point gap maybe even a five to ten point gap in political results when we did these head to head matchups of candidates featuring different attributes against each other really simulating um, the vote the choices voters face in the ballot box rather than just throwing up isolated slogans or policy ideas. So I think this already gives us a, a sort of a more real world sense of how voters operate. But candidates who offered an economic focus as opposed to a sort of a bread and butter focus uh, uh, as opposed to a focus on racial justice or immigration. Um, that was accounted for broadly about a five point boost in the polls. Candidates who, who spoke in populist uh, rather than what we sort of shorthanded as, as woke language that is identity centered um, language, you know, sort of highlighting suffering and vulnerability and diversity and that made a moral appeal as opposed to that made a, uh, a concrete economic material appeal, blaming millionaires and lobbyists. That also accounted for, again, a broadly five to 10 point difference. And then candidate background themselves also mattered. So uh, candidates who were teachers and construction workers performed significantly better than candidates who were uh, attorneys or CEOs. Working class voters want uh, to vote for working class candidates, and, and that's something that we should keep in mind. So when you mix and match some of these attributes, you've got some really striking findings. You know, uh, a, a teacher, uh, you, you could really build up massive leads, and this is a new stat that, that they've unveiled for me today. Um, uh, a, a, a progressive populist teacher, that is, who spoke in language of, um, you know, a battle against the super rich uh, and with a focus on economics, won 76 percent of our sample. Whereas if you had a CEO, this is a very plausible Democratic candidate, by the way, a CEO who uh, we classed as a kind of a woke moderate with an emphasis on sort of diversity and uh, fighting for account uh, affordable health care in a kind of um, very muted way um, with a focus on racial justice. That candidate won 44 percent of the vote. So this is a 32 point gap. I mean, this is actually staggering to me even uh, in terms of, uh, you know, vindicating a certain theory of politics. This isn't even a 10 point gap. These are massive cleavages. That, that really show what working class voters want. So one thing that's really interesting is the survey finds that there's there's a messaging problem, but I also think Democrats have a deeper problem than just a messaging one because it's I'm, I'm thinking of why you know these these pitches are made in woke terminology um, and the survey says progressives do not need to surrender questions of social justice to win working class voters, but certain identity focused rhetoric is a liability. But that rhetoric is how they sort of push through neoliberal economic policies. It's it's their it's it, it's more than just the style. It's connected to their substance of kind of sneaking things through. So when you say the CEO candidate is plausible, the teacher one is really really interesting. I guess I'm just wondering from the looking at the data and analyzing the data how it's possible for Democrats to balance the style and the rhetoric um, with also because you get caught in these traps where if you say one thing wrong, the media pounces um, and says, you know, you're you're not, you're a sexist, you're a racist. We saw Bernie Sanders go on Joe Rogan, and that was a controversy in and of itself. So how is a Democrat supposed to balance all of these things? And actually, Matt, can I add a, can I add a question to that, which is that did your, did your survey find that voters were hostile to the racial justice 
message and that's what turned them off? Mm -hmm. Or do they believe that the CEO is lying about actually having any genuine concern about right. racial justice and is just using it as a cover for their more tepid economic message? There's no question to Emily's point that it's a challenging media environment for for progressive candidates. I mean, we saw this in the way that you know major news outlets covered Bernie Sanders. Um, it you know has you know been discussed ad nauseum, and I think almost corroborated with data in terms of the, the sort of the quantity of stories that came through and the opportunities that um, you know the corporate media took to take shots at at Bernie and absolutely using um, different forms of of. Uh, you know, including, uh, yeah, again, what we shorthanded as woke politics against Bernie. But, but to Ryan's point, um, so that's a, that's going to be a challenging issue for any candidate who comes out with a with a populist, um, unapologetically, you know, economically left message. I think that that's true. Um, and this survey doesn't have clear answers for that, other than to say that uh, the good news is on on Ryan's point is no, this is not. We found literally almost no evidence of. Uh, again, in, among the potentially democratic working class electorate, we found no evidence of what pol political scientists sometimes call racial conservatism or hostility towards uh, a strong, forthright, vigorous opposition to systemic racism even. Uh, you know, uh, our, our, our survey uh, takers were were very firm on this. Uh, and um, the, the question is, is not that these voters are in any way hostile to, to, to questions of racial justice. The question is when candidates, uh, I think, uh, whether moderate or progressive, center um, these kind of moral and identity focused appeals to, to the point of crowding out the bread and butter economic goods that uh, progressives aim to deliver, um, then uh, the candidates seem to suffer. Uh, and you, you can look at this whether whether we classed it all, you know, candidates had to give their day one priorities. So you can see, you know, day one priorities of jobs and economics were stronger than racial justice. That was true even for voters who were on record elsewhere, you know, in the survey supporting candidates who oppose systemic racism. So it's not about, um, you know, uh, you know, voters being lukewarm in their opposition to, 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 to racial discrimination or racial oppression. It's about how candidates reach out. And so just to peel off one more version of this to one more piece of data, you know, Latino voters, there's been a lot of talk about Latino voters and race these days. And, and you know, why are, why did Latinos trend toward Trump in, 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 in 2020? And, uh, you know, even more recently, you know, we've seen the numbers, uh, you know, turn against the Democrats. So if you look at Latino voters, candidates who, uh, two candidates who both make racial justice at the center of their messaging, we looked at, which is, you know, overall not the strongest approach, but still, the candidates who you know spoke in the sort of progressive populist language uh, won 67 percent of the of Latino response, respondents in our survey, whereas those who use this sort of identity and activist focused language, uh, you know, of vulnerability and of the sort of survival, um, you know, name checking, you know, various constituencies, only won 46 percent of those votes. So I think again, that's a, that's a really huge gap. Um, that's not really about whether racial justice is an important part of progressive politics. We know it is, and it has to be central. And I think anyone who would want to sort of make the claim that Jacobin is, is you know, trying to sort of sideline a fight for racial justice, I think that's a straw man. The question is, though, how do you make that appeal? Um, do you make it in populist terms, or you do, do you make it in this very sort of specialized, um, I, I would say, as an academic, academically, you know, sort of um, derived language? And I think it's clear that this that this approach is not as successful. And if you want to win Latino votes, if you want to win blue collar votes, if you want to win working class votes, if you want to change politics in this country, it, it makes sense to pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, and the condescending sort of contention from the center is that we must prioritize style or just style over substance, and that's really what that's that's how we win um, working class voters. And the immigration issue is one where all of this sort of comes into play, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Matt Carp, thank you so much for taking the time to break down these numbers. Thank you. Super, super important survey. We hope you all check it out at Jacobin, and we will have more rising for you right after this.